I would like to welcome everyone to our evangelistic series entitled The Evidence for Faith. Today's uh, presentation um, will be entitled uh, Multiple Convergence Crisis. Um, at this time, we're going to pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, dear Lord, for the wonderful news that you have brought to us. And now that we know that you are a Savior, dear Heavenly Father, and we know that um, we can come to you with all our problems, we ask, dear Heavenly Father, that we continue to take forward uh, the steps necessary for our hearts uh, to be sanctified, dear Lord, in your word. At this uh, presentation and the following presentation that will follow, we ask that we may submit our minds and hearts to the words that we hear, dear Lord. Let us not harden our hearts at this time, for we see what uh, the present uh, has to offer, and it is not good, and the future will not get better. But dear Heavenly Father, we are encouraged by the words that you give us to be obedient, and you will protect us. So at this time, dear Lord, let us hear thy words and soften our hearts again to thy will. In Christ I pray. Amen. Amen. Today's scripture comes from uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14 and 16. These things write I unto you. Oh, I'm sorry. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14 and 16. These things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. Verse 16, and without controversy, great is thy mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believeth on in the word, receiveth up into glory. At this time, Sister Nadaka will lead out in our song service. Good afternoon, everyone. We'll begin our song service with hymn number 221. 221. Rejoice, the Lord is King. 221. Together. Rejoice, the Lord is King, your Lord and King adore. Rejoice, give thanks and sing, and triumph evermore. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again, I say. Rejoice, Jesus the Savior reigns, the God of truth and love. When he had purged our stains, he took his seat above. Lift up your heart. Lift up your voice, rejoice again, I say, rejoice. His kingdom cannot fail, he rules o'er earth and heaven. The keys of death and grave are to our Jesus given. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again, I say, rejoice. Rejoice in glorious hope, our Lord the just shall come, and take his servants up to their eternal home. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again, I say, rejoice. Amen. Praise the Lord. We'll continue with hymn number 617, 617. 
We are living, we are dwelling. Six one seven. Together. We are living, we are dwelling in a grand and awful time. In an age on ages stalling to be living in sublime. Hark the waking up of nations, God and may go to the fray. Hark what sounded is creation, groaning for her latter day. Christian rouse and on for conflict, nerve thee for the battlefield. Bear the helmet of salvation and the mighty gospel shield. Let the breastplate peace be on thee. Take the spirit sword in hand. Boldly, fearlessly go forth then in Jehovah's strength to stand. And the prince of evil spirits, great deceiver of the world, he who had the blessed Jesus wants his deadly weapons hurl. Come with unwanted power, knowing that his reign will cease. When the kingdom shall be given to the mighty Prince of Peace. Christian rouse fight in this warfare. Cease not till the victory's won. Till your captain loud proclaim it. Servant of the Lord, well done. He alone who thus is faithful, who abided to the end, hath the promise in the kingdom and eternity to spend. Amen. Praise the Lord. Our opening hymn will be hymn number 625. And we'll rise for opening him. And this will be a theme song for this week. Higher Ground 625. Together. I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day. Still praying as I onward bound, Lord plant my feet on higher ground. Lord lift me up and I shall stand by faith on heaven stable land. And a higher plane than I had found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. My heart has no desire to stay where doubts arise and fears dismay. Though some may dwell where these are bound, my prayer, my aim is higher ground. Lord, lift me up and I shall stand by faith on heaven's stable land. A higher plain than I had found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. 
I want to live above the world Though Satan's darts at me are hurled For faith has caught the joyful sound The song of saints on higher ground Lord, lift me up and I shall stand by faith on heaven's stable land A higher plain than I had found Lord, plant my feet on higher ground I want to scale the utmost high And catch a gleam of glory bright But still I'll pray till heaven I've found Lord, lead me on to higher ground Lord, lift me up and I shall stand By faith on heaven stable land a higher plane than I had found Lord plant my feet on higher ground Amen At this time the pastor for Covenant Advent Church will present at this moment Again, welcome again, and with that, we'll just have a short prayer, just if you could bow your heads again. Thank you, Lord, again for your love towards us. I pray that you may bless these words as we look into this topic of the multiple conversion crisis that we've seen in front of us this day. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, we talk about, um, since our audience haven't changed, so I will just go quickly through this first slide here. And so now, faith is a substance. Again, substance is something that is solid, and the solidness that we have in the Word of God, we can depend upon it. And so faith is the substance of things hoped for. So we hope, and in that hope that we have, in that hope that we have, that we hope for something that is different. We hope for a different experience, and in different, this different experience that we're hoping for, we believe that the Bible tells of it. And it's the evidence of things not seen. So faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things that we do not see. So somebody says, has anybody ever been to heaven and back and communicated to anyone? And says, well, the prophets have seen things, but nobody can say they've been there and back. There's a great gulf that is fixed. So Jesus says there's a great gulf that is fixed. And the question is, is there a great gulf that is fixed between us and heaven? And the answer is yes. So let me say, how are you certain of that? Well, we have sent up rockets into outer space, into space. We have sent up rovers. And at the end of the day, we can go millions and billions and billions of miles. And what happened? There's a great gulf that is fixed. A great gulf that is fixed. And even scientists now are saying they believe that there's life out there. Just scientists, regular scientists don't believe in no God. They say there must be life out there because it cannot be that in such a vast universe, what we used to think was stars, we now say, no, they're whole galaxies. And they say, how vast is it? And yet they're saying it's so vast, how could we be the only one or only planet that has life on it? The Bible says we're not the only one. We're not the only planet. But again, have you seen it? No, but there's evidence. And based upon the evidence, even secular scientists are saying there must be life out there. It's too much evidence for there not to be life. And we skip down. It says, that says, so for so who is ever called upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Verse 17 say, says, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by what? The word of God. And so we're going to look at something very specific tonight. And we're going to look at is this topic of multiple conversion crises, multiple crises that we're seeing. And all of these things we're going to talk about is things that we're seeing in front of us. And I look at it as these things that we're seeing, they are evidence of faith and they're evidence to believe in one specific event. And that's the event of the second coming. So we're not specifically dealing with second coming. We're dealing with what's happening that will bring us to this point where there's going to be a second coming. So somebody says, Lord, it's kind of idea of a second coming. It's not a negotiable idea. It's a needed idea. The things that are happening and where this world is going, 
Jesus is going to need to come. He's going to need to come for all of us. And he's going to need to come to put some people out of their misery who are not living right because they themselves, they're putting themselves out of their own misery. Now, one of the first signs that we're going to go to straight to is that miracles and signs in the last days will multiply. Now, in Matthew chapter 24, verse 23 to 25, it says, Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is the Christ, and there is, and there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christ. We have seen this to this day. More and more people coming out and say, There, Jesus. Right? And false prophets, people preaching the prophetic word as we cover in the first three presentation, that we have to look at this idea of what is true prophecy. Because I'm sure you've dealt with somebody that come and want to lay hands on you mm -hmm. and say that they have a prophecy for you. You're going to get married in two months. Said, but I'm already married. Okay, okay you're going to get money to... Everybody claiming out to be a prophet. Yep. You know, prophet, prophet such and such in this church and that church. Mm -hmm. So when somebody talk about, says, prophecy, I think many people realize that so this idea of prophetic, the prophetic utterances is going to happen in the last day. So there's a lot of false prophet rising and shall show great signs and wonders. Great signs and wonders. And the question is, I remember talking to a gentleman, he says, you remember, he was in Florida at a, at, a, at a religious gathering, and he says he saw Mary appear in front of him. And everybody saw her. Great signs and wonders. In so much that if it were possible, they shall deceive the what? The very elect. So the Bible says this is what will be happening. The very elect will be even on the risk, because this is how good these signs and wonders are. And this is not, no joke, not, as the Bible said that, this is actually one of the first things I'll point to, too, as a crisis that is coming upon the line. And why this is a crisis, Christ says, behold, I told you before it had happened. Why this is a crisis, it's because when you look at what's going on, these people, they're not telling people to live right. Now, just imagine you are following a religious teacher, and you're following somebody that's doing signs and wonders, but he's not talking about living godly. Not talking about holiness. Not talking about the Ten Commandments. Is that a, a bad thing? Yes, sir. That's a bad thing. Because guess what happened? At the end of the day, we shall be judged by the law. Mm -hmm. And God's going to have to destroy other sinners who thought they were serving him. But they said, Lord, I follow the signs and wonders. And I'm still living an ungodly life. And we're going to go back to that later on. Now, Jesus warned against seeking signs only to believe. I put this two, few texts on the board as a, a cautionary note as I go into what I would call a signs and wonders presentation. When we talk about end time signs or a converging crisis, we could get so caught up into looking into crisis and issues that we're not paying attention to what is, what is going on with my soul. So I always want to put that cautionary word. So Jesus says, I'm warning you against this idea of seeking only signs. Signs will happen. Notice, every time it's a major disaster anywhere in the world, people run to church. You know, pray a little bit, and then they run away from church. Because they have to go back to business. And it seems like the more spectacular the signs and wonders happen, or the more spectacular things happen, is the less and less people are committed. They get excited a little bit, and then they calm down again. Get excited, because you can get too caught up in the signs and wonders. In John chapter 4, verse 48 says, then sent Jesus unto him, except you see signs and wonders, ye shall not what? Believe. Now, this is a problem that's developing in our society. People always say, look, if I can't see a sign, if I can get a lightning bolt strike me in my head, I can't believe in God. I can't do right. People take this thing very serious. They want to see a signs and wonders, and Christ was dealing with this in the day. Now, you're saying, now, how could Christ say this? Christ worked so many miracles. But people still didn't believe. Now, it wasn't an issue they didn't believe Christ was something special. It was what he was asking them to do. They didn't want to do it. See, they, they get excited. There's many of the most wise men in the world that love the teachings of Jesus. Is that true? Mm -hmm. Love the parables of Jesus. Love the, the Beatitudes. Love the Sermon and Thoughts and the Mount of Blessing. All those things. They love it. But what is the problem? They don't like the part which Christ started talking about doing right. Mm -hmm. Amen? They don't like that. And because of that, they're looking for sign, but sign often is used to excite. So I'm saying this up front as I'm going to get in some exciting things. But I just wanted to say to you that says our basic faith, our faith is not based only upon signs. It is there to strengthen our faith, but we still have to live by the commandments of the Lord. Amen. Matthew chapter 16, verse 1, 2, 3, and 4 says, The Pharisees also 
with the Sadducees came tempting desire him that he should show them a sign from heaven. And he answered and said unto them, When it is even you say it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and lowering. O ye hypocrites, ye can discern the face of the sky, but can ye not discern the signs of the time? A wicked and adulterous generation seek after sign, and there shall no sign be given unto it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. And he left them and departed. And they're like, huh? The signs of the prophet who? Jonah. Right? No sign shall be given them. And at that point, he left and he departed from them. Now, this is important because he was going to do a signs and wonder. Is the death of Christ signs and wonder? Yes. Um, is the resurrection of Christ signs and wonder? Yes. Did the Pharisees know that says Christ was going to die? He told them, did they know to seal the grave or the tomb? Yes. Right. He did tell them. So did they get enough sign? Yes. And what did they do with those signs? They misused it. And what the Lord says here? Wicked and adulterous generation. They didn't want to do right. So he was going to give them a sign. They asked for a sign. He said, I'm going to give you a sign. But what was the problem with that sign? I'm going to tell you what the problem with that sign. They were on the wrong side of the plot. You see the problem there? Now, is this a multiple conversion? One of the multiple conversion? Yes. What is it? What's the sign there? What's happening here is a religious world. Those who are supposed to be God's men and women, they are playing the part in this way here. They're the ones that end up killing Christ. Were they the ones that supposed to herald in the, the Messiah? Yeah. Yes. And Christ said, that itself is a sign of wonder. Don't you think it's a sign of wonder when you see God's people doing the wrong thing? Mm -hmm. huh? Don't you see when we're supposed to be talking about end time events, who's supposed to be excited? God's people, right? Who seem to be bored? To me, that's a sign of wonder. And Christ is saying, that says, look, you're the one that's supposed to be ushering the Messiah. You're the one that end up killing the Messiah. That's the sign. And what I'm going to end with is where I'm starting out here. That one of the signs that the religious world is going to turn on its head. It's already showing that it's on its head. And it's going to flip right over. And they're going to become the ones that persecute God's people. And that in itself is a sign. Because how do you serve Jesus and then persecute his servants, his followers? How do you do it? How do you bend down and you kneel down to Jesus and Jesus, I love you. Thanks for dying for my sin and then go and persecute somebody that is living righteous. Is that a sign? That's fascinating. You see people do it all the time. And Christ said, I'm going to show you a sign. And this is what we see developing in the religious world as a presentation in itself. But we say that that's a big event that's happening. The religious world is going to hell in an basket. We're going to touch on that again before we close. Events and incidents that, predict, um, that is predicted in the Bible. So we see that says, in the last day, one of the, what I would call the multiple conversion um, crises would be that says, People start to use this phrase. I remember we were looking at the evidence for faith. Have you ever heard people use the phrase, say it was of biblical proportion since of late? I'm going to ask it one more time just to make sure we all together on the same page. Have you ever heard people since of late start recently, in the last especially decade, keep saying it's of biblical proportion? Have you been heard hearing that? Now, where are they getting this idea from? It's from the Bible. And what I'm pointing out here is I believe in the last day, we're going to be seen as one of the multiple conversion incidents is disasters that's going to be referred to as their biblical proportions. Only in the Bible you ever heard such a thing happening. And normally people say this is one of the reasons why they reject the Bible. Because the stories in the Bible are too outlandish. They're too crazy. They're just too large. Until a tsunami hit and they say, wait a minute, haven't we ever read about something? Where do you? Oh, I remember reading something else when I was young in the Bible. Only the Bible you hear about these crazy stories of 200,000 people die and plagues of biblical proportion. But I tell you, they're coming. And those are the multiple conversion ish crisis. So here we look at this in Amos chapter 5, verse 18 to 20. And it says in Amos here, Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. Hmm. For what end is it for you? The day of the Lord is darkness and not what? Not light. As if a man did flee from the li a lion, and a bear met him, or went into the house and leaned into his, um, leaned his hand on the wall, and a serpent bit him. 
Shall not the day of the Lord be darkness and not light? E even very dark and no brightness in it. So when we talk about the multiple conversion crisis that we're going to be looking at from here going forward, we're looking at incidents and things that are at biblical proportion. That nothing will be able to stop it. Well, the first thing we look at is increased disasters and diseases. Increased disasters and diseases. In Matthew 24, verse 7, it says, For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. We're going to come back to verse 7, but I want to just look at this here. Now, when you look at nations shall rise against nation, before, a nation rise against nation, they were using javelin and swords, if you want to call it machete, but javelins and swords. What do they do today? They have a thing called javelin, but what comes out is... It's a javelin, all right, but it's not a javelin like what they used to use in the Bible. So when we talk about nation rise against nation, we're talking about nuclear threat, nuclear bombs. Everything has changed. And what it is, what I'm talking about is that says this idea of biblical proportion becomes something that is normal to us going forward. Because men have the ability to destroy wonderfully. So if you've seen the war in Syria, you can take note and says you can devastate a town and make it become nothing, a piece of rubble, a massive town, and bring it to a rubble. And this is the possibility that we have nowadays. And so it says here, shall nation shall rise against nation and kingdom, and there shall be famine, pestilence, and earthquake in diverse places. This is what is assembling itself right in front of us. There are 7 billion people on the earth. Population is a lot of people. So there's a lot of bodies to die off. And things are not going to get pretty. And so we're talking about the increase in disasters at massive proportions and biblical proportion. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the star upon the earth. That's Luke chapter 21 verse 25. And distress of nation and per with perplexities and the seas and the waves roaring. Now this text is important for most people that have said the Bible. Because some of these things here has happened in some instance in the 1800. But what we're talking about here, that there's perplexities. Now this word here, that there's perplexing problem that nobody knows what to do with. Some of them I will touch on to that before we close. Perplexities, that means you're looking at problems and there's no proper solution for the problem. There's no solution for the problem. And most of the problems we're having today is problems, there are problems that there's no solution for. Verse 26 says, Men heart failing them for fear and for looking at those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of the heaven shall be what? Shaken. Now I believe that this will happen in our time. We're sort of seeing things with meteors and stuff like that. But look at it. A lot of the thinking people in our society, a lot of the thinking people in our society are very fearful. Every time there's a shooting, what do you see happen shortly after the shooting? Gun sales goes up. Gun sales goes up. Now, why are they buying the guns? They're, probably, they're seeing impending disaster coming. And they're seeing people taking what they have. And they're thinking they need to do what? They need to protect themselves. So this idea of perplexities and this idea of looking on the things that are coming are going to be per perplexing. So we know that the increase in disasters are happening already. I remember we were reading and we look at it and it says, can whole towns get wiped out by a disaster? And we've seen it happen a few times in the last year. And then we continue. Increasing diseases. Isaiah chapter 24 verse 3 through 6 says, The land shall utterly be emptied and utterly spoiled, for the Lord has spoken this word. The earth mourneth and fadeth away, and the world languisheth and fadeth away, and the other people of the earth do languish. The earth also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof. Because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinances, broken the everlasting covenant. Therefore the curse devoured the earth. And they that dwell therein are desolate. Therefore the inhabitants of the earth is burnt and few men left. What the Bible is predicting here is a total overthrow of every law and every principle that is on the earth. Now we can't pull back from modernity, but what has modernity brought to us? Pollution at levels that is unbelievable. And because of that pollution, somebody says, well, you know, the earth languishes. And we say, yes. How about the animals, which we're going to touch in a second? Yes. 
Because if you have an animal that is a free range animal, it's flying around free. What is he flying around? It's flying around in good land, pristine land. And it's flying around in toxic soups. Toxic soups of waste, toxic soups of chemical. And then you take it and say, oh, that deer looks so nice and healthy. It's, it's healthy. I'm going to shoot it and I'm going to eat it. What are you eating? You eat your diseases. And what is this happening because of the earth languishing? The animals are diseased, and many of the plants are contaminated. The ground is contaminated, the water is contaminated. And again, if I say this 30 years ago, say bottled water will become one of the, will be, be the number one selling product, the biggest cost product in all foods, you tell me to like, get out of here. Bottled water. Now, we are most dependent upon drinking from bottled water because the water is so contaminated. And this is a crisis because what happened, the disease is rising. Now somebody say, well, are you certain of this? And I says, have you checked what's going on in our society? The disease in the people is high. The disease in the animals are high. And it's going to get worse. And no matter what they do, they will not be able to fix it because sooner the people are going to get the reali realization that says they're going to get sick, go to the hospital and get sicker. Get sicker. The sickness is getting worse. Another point in this here. Um, Again, I want to go back to this text. Now, in Micah 24, verse 7, what we just read, it says that it uses this word pestilence, right? Pestilence. Now, we know what a pestilence is, right? Pestilence is something like the bubonic plague. Pestilence is a plague, like the bubonic plague. There's something that started to kill millions of people. Now, what's on the horizon for us? What's on the horizon for us is that there is what we call drug-resistant every disease. Every disease. Right? It used to be drug resistant, one disease, two disease. Now, every disease now is drug resistant. There's drug resistant syphilis, drug resistant gonorrhea, drug resistant tuberculosis, drug resistant um, bird flu, swine flu. Everything is not drug resistant. What does that mean? It means that what, when Christ says in the last days there will be pestilence, Christ means what he says. In the last day, we'll be dealing with pestilence. So say, somebody say, well, that still doesn't mean that there's pestilence. Well, think about it. Pestilence is a, is a, you can't get rid of it. It's just killing and wiping out people. And if you have a disease that can't be treated with drugs, how do you get rid of the disease? That's a, one of what I would say is a conversion. What a conversion is something that's coming together like this. The disease, the, we already have the disasters. We already have the wars, and they're going to increase. And next, I'm putting forth here that there's pestilence that nobody can do anything about. They say we need to invest more money in research for antibiotics. It won't work because they can't solve the disease problem. Unless you're using natural means, those disease won't be solved. And so we are seeing an increase, especially in the last five years. It's been happening for the last probably 10, 15, 20 years. But especially in the last five years, almost every disease has become now drug resistant. And the resistance is increasing exponentially each year. And I believe within a few years, you're going to go to the hospital and you're going to go there to pick up a drug-resistant disease. Nothing alarming here. That's just the reality of what's going on. This is what the Bible calls pestilence. And this is something we see increasing on the land. And so we have false doctrines. We have pestilence. Another thing here that I want to point out that will increase disease is the animals. Now, you, as you're, not tonight because we're leaving in the night, but if you're coming in the morning, you drive past free-range farms with free-range cows, and you tell me if those cows look healthy. Now, Hosea chapter 4, verse 1 through 6 says, Hear the word of the Lord, ye children of Israel, for the Lord had a controversy with the inhabitants of the land, because there is no truth, nor mercy, nor knowledge of God in the land. What is happening? No truth, no mercy, and no... People have rejected. 60% of South America believe that they evolved from a chimp or something. 60%. Now, how is that working out for the country? It's not making the country better. It's making it worse. But they say, oh, no, it's something that's making the country worse. Well, again, I say there's no... What did the Bible say? There's no truth, there's no mercy, and there's no knowledge of God in the land. By swearing and lying and killing and stealing and committing adultery, they break out and blood. Touch it what? Blood. So that means it's a general sense of immorality. Therefore shall the land mourn, and everyone that dwelleth therein shall languish. Now what is languishing? Languishing is like your long, slow march to death in sickness and in pain 
but you're not sick enough to die, you're just sick to suffer. That's languishing. You're languishing. It's like you're there and you die and you can't die. And this weekend in America, every year, every weekend, about, I think, 30 people commit suicide because they're languishing. Every weekend. That's a statistic. And most of them, they put a gun to their mouth and end it. Because they're suffering so long and so hard that they say, I can't take this anymore. Irritable bowel syndromes, Crohn's disease, cancer, all this decrepitness from, decrepitness from just being old and sick and they'll say, Look, I can't take it anymore, I'm going to put myself out. And this is says here that the land more knowing it and everyone that dwell there in language with the beasts of the field. Now, is the beast of the field languishing? If you don't believe me, go on YouTube and look at some of the animals that they're giving to people for food. Look at animals that they're giving to people for food. <laughs> Wanna enjoy? Wanna join in our excitement? <laughs> look at the animals that they're giving people for food. Are they languishing? Yes. The animals are languishing because you see an animal is still alive, but he can't stand up. So they get a forklift, lift the cow up. And bring it to the slaughterhouse, slaughter the cow, and say, here you go, food for you. And you eat the food, are you going to languish? Yes, you're going to go to the doctor. I've been there, I've seen it. The person's in the doctor's up, in the hospital, and they're running tests after tests after tests, and the person's waste away dying, and they can't figure out even what's wrong with the person. Must have to start treating the person because the person is languishing away. I remember somebody telling me that they're, in, they're a nurse, they're in the hospital, they went to pick up a lady. They hold on to the hand of the lady and the, hand, the skin of the lady come off in their hand. The person is basically rotting and falling away while alive. This idea here of language and we're seeing this. So if you, I just say, you, somebody say, well, no, this is what's happening now. And the beasts of the field are languishing. Somebody say, oh yeah, I'm eating, you're eating free what? Isn't it free? You ain't free of languishing diseases. Falling apart while they're there. And this is a crisis that is getting worse, not getting any better. And the fowls of the heaven are languishing. Notice he didn't say the fowls in the cage are languishing. The fowls in the heavens are languishing. Yea, the fish of the sea also shall be taken away. This is an end time prophetic word. Now somebody say, well, Lord, what if it just, it was back then. Whenever we read in history that this thing happened. It never happened. But we are seeing this text come to pass in our day. We're looking outside and we're seeing people that they're walking around and they're living dead. Dead, dead, dead. But they're still alive. They're not in their right minds and they're not in their right bodies. Because, because they're languishing. Yea, let no man strive nor reprove another. For thy people are they that strive with the priest. What's going on here? Preach, person preaching and say, I don't want to hear that pastor. Don't preach that to me. Because I want to live the life I want to live. So God says, leave them alone. Right? Therefore shall thou fall in the day. And the prophets also shall fall that are with thee in the night. And I will destroy thy mother. My people are destroyed, what? For lack of knowledge. Because they have rejected knowledge. And I also will reject thee. That thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. Hmm? What's going on here? You're told what to do. You're told what's coming. And you say, I'm not going to listen to it. I don't want to hear it. So God says, don't argue with them anymore. Leave them and let them enjoy their life. They're living the good life. They will rot and fall apart while being alive. Because you know what happened? They're arguing with truth and they're fighting against truth. Is that what's happening? So you look around. I always say to people, just walk around your community. Look at the people and say, these people are not languishing. You know, back in the past, it used to be that says, people are falling apart, are dying in their, in their 40s and 50s and 60s. Now in their 20s, they're coming out with all kinds of genetic diseases. As I say, everybody's running for cancer. Everybody's running for it or, or against it or running away from it. And it's running after them and it's catching them, tripping them up and giving to them and destroying them. Because they're eating their cancer. And so that's one of the signs. And this languishing disease is destroying the health sector. It's causing the country millions and billions of dollars. And every country. They have said there's countries that are more obese than America. 30% of Americans are obese. 
And yet there are countries that are more. Tango, Togo, somewhere like that. Other countries. The Samoan. Mm -hmm. China is getting up there. It's a global problem. What we're talking about is not something that is one thing. People are eating their way to suffering. Because they think that this life is the only thing that they have and they're going to eat themselves to happiness. So again, we see this and we're looking outside. Tomorrow we're covering health. So we're going to go with some solutions. But tonight we're looking at one thing is the diseases in the land. And most of these diseases, there's a solution. And the death rates are phenomenal that's going on around us. Now, another thing that is a crisis that's going on, connected to the eating and drinking, I mean to the disease, is eating and drinking. Now, in Micah 24, verse 37 through 39, we have this problem. Now, somebody say, why would this be an end time sign? And I say, if you can't see this, you can't see nothing I'm talking about. Because remember, we talk about the evidence for faith. We're saying the Bible says it, and I, I can't see God, but I can see that what the Bible says is happening. The Bible says here in Matthew chapter 24, verse 37, But as the day of Noah were, so also was the coming of the Son of Man. For as the day that they were, that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking. So somebody says, Lloyd, look, what's the big deal? People always eat and drink. Don't you eat and drink? I eat and drink. Do you eat and drink? <laughs> Do you? You eat and drink, right? So why would the Lord just say the obvious? Obviously that there's eating and drinking that is not normal. It's beyond normal. And it was a reason why God had to destroy the then known earth. And today we have epic proportion of eating and drinking. Our chicken is just snack. It's the appetizer. The whole chicken. So here, he said they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So the Lord is saying that just before the second coming, we're going to have a problem with eating and drinking. Are we there? Yeah, we're there. People make it like it's a light thing. To just, you know, five, ten burgers, nothing. It's a snack. And we just keep going. And we see that the levels of obesity, the levels of the epidemic, the levels of the problem that's having with the, you know, I remember watching this thing where it says it's called, it was something on some TV program that I was, when I was in Florida one time, and it says something about like a one ton dad or half ton dad, because half ton is a thousand pounds. And it took out a tumor out of his right thigh, 25 pound, a tumor out of his left thigh, 25 pound, two tumors, tumors that big, 25 pound. Now, you might think in 25 pounds and 25 pounds, it's 50 pounds, I'm, and I'm not even half, that's half my weight, but I'm bigger than that. I'm heavier than 50, double time 50 pounds. Just the tumor was almost half of me. Can you imagine that? And what did he do to get that? Eat it. And what is a solution for that? Is to encourage people to be free and eat and eat. This is a crisis, and this is going to cause more problems in our country and in the world. Because it's a global problem. They're saying that they were surprised to find out that this country that is larger than America. They thought America was, was the king, but we believe that still America is the king. But that is it. So eating and drinking is one of these things that I say is a sign of the second coming. And it's part of the impending doom that is coming upon the place. Because people are basically causing disease. Because the more unhealthy you are, is the more disease. Now, continue here. I don't want to spend too much time on one point. The love of many shall wax cold. And many false prophets shall arise. Matthew chapter 24, verse 11 through 13. And many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax what? Cold. But he that endure to the end, the same shall be saved. Now, this idea of the love of many shall wax cold. Are we seeing this? Yes, we're seeing this. You don't need no deep analysis from me. To know that says people have come to a point now where it is just not about if somebody tells <laughs> no if somebody bad drive me on the road you know what I do I keep looking forward now because if I didn't even see them I just like just I just didn't see them because somebody will bad drive you on the road and they want to look at it and says they, they want to attack you for them to do you wrong this is how people are right now why is this love of many wax cold and I see this as an end time sign. 
Because what I believe had happened is this, that says, the effect of falsehood and deception. Nobody's, nobody don't trust anybody anymore. People don't trust people anymore. People believe that everybody is about to con them. And the problem is that say, most people is about to con you. If you get a call on the phone, you start getting nervous because you're thinking, what's with this call? Or what are you trying to sell? What are you trying to deceive me into buying? Is that what's going on? Yeah, that's what's, what's going on. Also, we have, I believe, that says in the last few years, especially the last probably 30 years, the false pastors has worked a miracle to destroy the faith of people in the country. All these fallen pastors like Jimmy Swaggart and all these people, they have made people have no faith in God and the Bible. Because people see them and people say, man, churches, whatever, and thousands leave the church every time one of them fall. All these prosperity gospel preachers, they empty our churches. Because after why everybody thinks religion is a sport for fools. It's just a bunch of people just being deceived. All of this wickedness that's happening, when we see the pouring out of cases of little boys that were raped and little girls that were raped by these priests, we look at it and all these little kids, they had family. Think about the devastation of the family. When they find out that their little Tommy and their little Mary Sue was raped by a priest, they don't believe in God anymore, many of them. They become infidels. And their love become cold. They become untrustworthy of everyone. See, all this wickedness that's been happening in the society has a toll. It has a toll, and it's been taking its toll in the society. And now people just in the mindset, let's get drunk, eat, drink, and be married because tomorrow we all die. They don't believe anymore. Because how could God allow this type of stuff to happen? And it's caused the love of many to wax close. Because remember in verse 11, it says here, without doing too much analysis here for you, that many false prophets and shall, shall what? Deceive what? Many. Deceive. You see what's going on there? When you find out that you've been duped, how do you feel? When, the more you trust, the more it's painful. The more you believe in that person, is the more painful it is. And just think about it. Oh, my priest is a man of the cloth. Oh, he decided he don't want to get married, just want to serve the Lord. And you find out, oh, my priest is not the man of the cloth. And then you say, we have a problem. And because of this, because of this, right? Iniquity shall abound. We mean iniquity shall abound. Because you don't believe anymore. So you're just thinking... Look, I think the worst sinner is a person who walk away from the church. It's better to never ever join a church and be a sinner than to be a sinner that walk away from the church. Because that person is brutal when they come out of their sinning. They just, they, as I said, they just leave the church, and as I said, the bus had held wide open. They're just like, they're going to part, and they, and they do it without no conscience. They're not thinking, how should I do No. Dangerous, and yet they're doing it while they're preaching the gospel. Have you met somebody like that? I've met people like that. Oh, yeah, the Bible says such and such and such. And you, why you, you're saying that you better be watching your wife? Because they're quoting the Bible, but they can't be trusted. And you better put your hand in your pocket and hold on to your, your wallet. Find your wallet, wherever it's at. And hold on to it. Because, you know, they start talking that Bible stuff and start quoting Jesus. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, we love Jesus. Love Jesus. And love your money also. Can't be trusted. Again, many false prophets shall arise and deceive many. And because of the iniquity shall abound. Iniquity, that means the person is hardened in sin. Still, still talking some Bible, preaching because they're false prophets. So they're preaching something. It says, the love of many shall wax cold. And we see that there's so many people, they don't believe a thing. They even go to church, but they don't believe nothing. Love wax cold. They don't love nobody. Hateful, right? And when you ask them, you, you feel sad for them because you, they tell you some experiences they've gone through. And they break your heart. Break your heart. Say, somebody did that to you? Tell me that person was an infidel. Oh, he was a Christian? Painful. But he, he went door to the end, shall be saved. The same shall be saved. You've got to fight that battle. I tell anybody that says, you don't have to just overcome sin. You have to overcome the church members. Right? If you can't overcome the church members, you're going to hell. Because you're not going to endure. You have to know what you're dealing with. I know that says, look, some of these people, they're just not straight. They talk crooked. 
and they are crooked. Oh, don't judge their heart. I'm going to move on. Um, that's a whole sermon there. State of the church in the last days. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 through 5. Now I say this text is talking about church people, not just secular people. It's a good text to talk about the secular folk. But the bottom part, it says, and a, and a form of godliness. That means they have a form of godliness. Now one of the things that's causing a problem in the society, let me tell you something. This is for real as it can get real. We look in the areas in the United States that have the largest population of homosexuals. And they're most of the time areas that has big Catholic populations. There's areas in Los Angeles and San Francisco that have one priest raping over 250 known cases of young men. And many of these young men became homosexual. And they're saying, that says, oh, they're born that way. Some of them might be born that way because we have hereditary, but we also have cultivated tendencies. And I've listened to people who have interviewed and says, you know, after I got raped, when I think anything sexual, I see a man in my head, not a woman anymore. Because the priest did that to me. Or my uncle, my brother, or whoever. So again, just imagine that happening, and this is a form of godliness because they do the hum, holiness. But when they do that, what it is they're doing is a lot of wickedness, a lot of wars, a lot of killing going on while they're doing their religious services. The Bible says, by their fruit you shall know them, but we have said, oh no, let's not judge the person, he's a good heart. How can it be a good heart? You see, do you do the good or you, you be good, but if you're not good, you're just not good. If you have not found Jesus, you just have not found him. So we come back down and we go back to the presentation. So we're back to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. This know also that in the last days, perilous time shall what? Come. Let's say perilous. Why is it going to get perilous? Because what we're looking at here is conversion crisis. And these crises, we see them in our society. There's happening before very highs. How many people that are the most biggest infidels that they oh yeah, I grew up going to church. And that, that you stop them because they're going to tell you some story that is going to break your heart. What happened to them in church? What the members did? What their family members did? What people did that are hypocrites in the church? Break your heart. Because you realize they have a reason, but that reason is still not going to keep, get them to go to heaven. They still need to serve Jesus. You know what I'm saying? But it says here, perilous time shall come in the last days. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. <laughs> Uh, narcissists, we call them movie stars and actors and um, what do you call it, reality TV act, um, people. Just look, you know, you're not interested in me? Just follow me on Twitter. I'll just tell you about myself. Lovers of themselves. And we have now built whole industries around these narcissists. That's how powerful to me Timothy is. Timothy, I mean, Paul is right in here. Covetous, boasters, as my time. Boasters, proud blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection. What's natural affection? Um, natural affection is a parent love for their children. Natural affection is what you have for your wife, or for your parents, or for your kids. That's gone through the door. Truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent. What is incontinent? Incontinent is like, I'll tell you what is incontinent. You want me to tell you? You know what incontinent is, right? Incontinent is that says, I will stand here, and just right in front of you, I just start urinating. That would be incontinent. I've lost control. No, has society lost control like that? Mm -hmm. Society. People in the church have lost control like this. Mm -hmm. And they want to defend their incontinence to you in Sabbath school and Bible study and stuff like that, saying, I have a right to be incontinent because nobody knows my heart. I have a good heart, but I have no control over myself. Without natural effects and true basis, for incontinent, fierce, despises of those that are good. If you're good, they don't like to be around you. Traders, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such, the Bible says what? Turn away. You need to move away from them. And you're going to have to give me a few minutes because I'm running out of time. Um, 2 Thessalonians describes this, that spiritualism will rise. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1 through 12. I'm going to skip that verse because um, the time. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 4. Um, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 says, Now the Spirit speak expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed the seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Now, why is this a conversion crisis that is coming upon us? Because have you heard about spiritual formation? Mm -hmm. Have you heard about spiritualism? Have you heard that it's in all Christian churches? Have you heard that it's in Adventism? Have you ever heard that says even the general conference president came out and says it's in the Adventist church and they're fighting against it or they're having problems with it in the church. Now why is that so important? 
Because if I tell, if I go into any Adventist church or any Baptist church, a Methodist church, really, 20 years ago, and tell them that says, soon in the Baptist church, Methodist church, and Adventist church, you're going to have a problem with spiritualism. People connecting with demons in the church. They'll tell me, you're talking crazy. No, we have a problem in the churches. The Bible says, I'm going to read it to you again. That that's a problem because remember, somebody said, Lord, why do you think this is a major problem for the world? The world is large. Because when the Christians go into hell in a handbasket, what you do with a secular person? Because they already messed up. See, the hope we have is always in the Christian, in the believers, the righteous, trying to hold back the winds of evil, hold back the tide of evil. When the righteous are joined on the demon side and start to communicate with demons, we have a problem? Mm -hmm. We have a problem. So here we have increased spiritual guides, psychic, things like Harry Potter fant fantasy. There's a lot of them. They are called a mystery religion. We have mystery religion in church. Anything to talk, talk about spiritual formation, where people chanting and stuff like that, is part of the, the, the Dark Ages religion. Can't get into that right now. Future presentation, I'll cover that. But you understand that. Um, another thing that we have here, I'm just going to summarize some of these things that we think is part of the increasing problems that we're facing in society. Preaching for gain, or again, preaching that gain is godliness. It's in 1 Timothy chapter 6, if you're writing down, verse 5 um, through 10. And it talks about this thing. I'll read the text for you so you can get the context. Perverse disputing of men of corrupt minds and destitute of truth, supposing gain is godliness. Have you ever heard this thing called prosperity gospel? Yes. Yeah, here Paul is saying, I says it's corrupt. From such withdraw thyself. Read it again. Perverse disputing of men of corrupt mind and destitute of truth, supposing that gain is godliness. From such, Paul says what? Draw away from them. And later on he goes, he says, Paul says, verse 6, but godliness with contentment is great gain. All right? Now, you know this famous says, this is a famous passage of scripture that says, verse 10, for the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith, pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Now, we see that people have professionally come in the Christian world and say, oh, we, we're a prosperity gospel preacher. Can you imagine that? We're a prosperity gospel preacher and people pack the house. And the Paul says, that says this, we should withdraw ourselves from these people. But the Christian world has embraced them as being the prominent preachers of America. If you want to know a prominent preacher of America, you go look and you, all of them, they're prosperity gospel. That's the one that America has embraced. Now, why is that a converging crisis? Because imagine the person that's supposed to be preaching righteousness is telling the member people that they need to prosper, they need to live rich, and they need to live raw, large, and not preaching them any truth. And these are the righteous. What do you do with the unrighteous? Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 3 says, For they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction come upon them, as travail upon a woman with child. And they shall not escape, but ye, virgin, are not in darkness, that the day should overtake you as a thief. I'll tell you what this is saying. James chapter 5, verse 1 through 6 says, Financial inequality will be a problem. Today we have a continuing growth of the difference between what the 1% make and those at the bottom. The 90% and especially those at the poor bottom. And this is going to be a continued problem. James chapter 5 predicts this will happen. Where it says, that says, Go to now, ye rich man, weep and howl for your miseries shall come upon you. And it says, your riches are corrupted and your garment is not eaten. Now, what this is speaking about is that says, it's not talking about those people who are lazy and don't want to work. It's talking about people who have worked, they're earning a living, but they're not getting the proper pay for what they're earning. They're being underpaid so that those who are rich are getting richer and richer. Because the problem is not an issue of that says they're making big bucks, is that they're making too much, while those at the bottom end is not making enough. Instead of raising the rate of people enough so everybody can make more. That's the problem. And that's what God is saying. So by doing that, they're becoming richer, 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 and we're living more luxuriously. And that's becoming an impending problem. Again, just in case, you know, just for clarity, we are told that this will end in war and bloodshed. Because you cannot keep so many people so poor and have few people rich. This is why countries that are like this always have to spend so much money on defense and police because the rich have to pay a lot of money to keep that system going. 
because the people will ultimately, we're told, especially in places like America, India, China, rise up against it. You can't have people dying of starvation. You can't have people be buried in, buried in mass graves because they're so poor while you're multi-billionaires and millionaires living. It's going to create a crisis, and the crisis is coming. And what we saw with like the one percent um, protests a few years back, that stuff has not changed. Because remember, the cause of those protests have not gone away. They're still here. And people are seeing it, and they can't do anything about it. Because they realize what is being created around us in all countries is a police state to protect the, those at the top. It's going to end in a bloodbath. It's a crisis that's coming, and I can do a whole presentation on that. This will end in a major wars and killing. Civil war, um, LNG war, it says, will erupt in these countries because you can't keep having this gap. Because people are working. I talk about lazy people are not working. We talk about people who are working, putting in their weekly amount of work, and they can't make ends meet. And sooner the people say they're going to have to go to the gun because the ballot voting is not working because the politicians are not changing anything. Another thing here is the ability to destroy the earth. In Revelation chapter 11, verse 18, it says, a nation, uh, And the nations were angry, and their wrath is come, and the time for the dead that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and to them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which what? Destroy the earth. This text, written almost 2,000 years ago, was not possible to be fulfilled up until recently, up until the last 50, 60, 70 years, until the ability to drop a bomb and blow up, incinerate a whole town came into existence. You couldn't destroy the earth. You couldn't light enough forest on fire. You couldn't throw enough javelin. You couldn't pull enough bow and arrow. You couldn't chop off enough people's head with, with a sword. But with the ability that you could incinerate a whole town, you could destroy the waters, you could destroy the air, you could destroy everything with the chemicals and the stockpile weapon. This is a modern ability. This text was not able to be fulfilled until now, until the last 60 years. This, I say, is a convergent crisis because all those bombs need to do is get into the wrong end or get, into the, or to get two people who have those bombs into a serious war where somebody needs to win. And who is willing to pull a trigger? Has a trigger been pulled before in these type of wars? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's been pulled, so it's possible. So it's always not, yes, it's possible. Because they wouldn't make it if it was not possible. And it's always deterrent. Determin, de deterrent. And again, why would you make it if you can't pull it? You can pull it, and if they start going off, as we see with Fukushima, Daiichi nuclear plant, when it got destroyed by that tsunami, we saw that that's a dead zone. Dead zone. We have the ability now to destroy the earth. And God says in last year, when he comes to judge, he will destroy those who destroy the earth. That means what I tell you. Because David says, that says, you're going to see a thousand drop at your right hand and a thousand at your other side. And he says, he will not come nigh you because God's angel will protect you because it's going to happen. Because as I say, the problem that happens here will escalate into wars. Because again, you're going to be living fat and we over here and you're going to arm yourself to the teeth. Well, how much of you are going to arm yourself to the teeth? And we all going to come and fight? It's going to be a problem. And this is what's going on. Jeremiah talk about the same thing. I read this Jeremiah text. I'm almost there, so just bear with me a second. I almost close it out. I'm trying to rush here through. Um, Jeremiah says, Jeremiah chapter 25, verse 31 through 33 says, And a noise shall come even to the end of the earth, for the Lord have a controversy with nations. With the who? Nation. Not you individual per se. The nations. He plea with all flesh. He will give them that are wicked to the sword, says the Lord. Says the Lord. Thus says the Lord God of hosts, Behold, evil shall go forth from nation to nation, and great whirlwind shall be raised up from coast to the what? To of the earth. So when we look at this, what, what does that look like? Have you ever seen a whirlwind? It's just, 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 just no explanation for this text. Verse 23, except for conventional wars or unconventional wars, I should say. 33 says, And the slain of the Lord shall be in the day from one end of the earth, even unto the other end of the earth. They shall not be lamented, neither gathered nor buried. They shall be dung upon the ground. We know that's an end time prophetic. Talk about the destruction of everywhere in the end. So we know this is coming. Almost the depletion of the resources of the earth. This is another impending disaster. You used to be able to buy copper for cheap. No, you can't buy copper for nothing on very expensive. People now who are on drugs will come and rip the copper out of your house. So use PECs. When you use PECs, you're using a chemical 
derivative somehow that's going to destroy the earth anyhow. But it's just you won't have to worry about them ripping it out of your house. So what's going on here? The, the resources of the earth are depleting. And people have to be going deeper and further to get crude oil. And the text is in 2 Peter chapter 3. And I'll just find the main part of it because of time. It says, oh yes, so for this willingly, talking about those who say, oh no, the second coming will never happen. Well, we've run out of resources. So they said, no, Lord, there's still so much crude oil in the ground. There's so much copper down there. Can you get it? The problem is that there is going to get it. I'm not sure why the text is saying that. For this willingly are they ignorant. Verse 5, I might. For this willingly they are ignorant that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the waters and in the waters whereby the world and then was then was being overflowed with water perish. But the heavens and the earth which are now Peter's right in the sense that the heavens and earth which are now what he says here by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto what? Fire against the day of judgment and perdition for ungodly men. Now remember the story of the flood. And what happened? The fountains of the deep broke up and waters gushed out of the fountain of the deep, right? And then fire came and then water came down from heaven. The Bible says in the last days, what will happen? It says, it's fire reserved. The fire is reserved for the day of perdition. What it says? Fire, oh, fire reserved, right? No, is there fire reserved in the earth? Yes. yes, there's fire reserved in the earth. This to me is the evidence of my faith. Is there fire reserved in the earth? Yes. Where is the fire reserved in the earth? The whole earth is a molten lava of fire. There's coal, there's crude. Everything in the earth is there reserved for fire. Now the big question that we have is, how did it get there? Where did they get there? They say, well, oh, geological plates. Where did these plates come from? Why are there so many? We have crude oil. What is crude oil? Fossil fuel, right? Where did fossil come from? Why are there so many dead bodies buried in the earth? Why is there so many dead animals buried in the earth? Why are there so many dead forests or forests covered, petrified forests covered that we can get coal from? And this is there. It says not all of it is going to be able to be extracted because it's there reserved for what? Fire. Is there fire under the earth? Yes. And it's reserved, the Bible says. So somebody said, are you certain about that? Yeah, because they cannot extract all the crude oil in the ground. Because it's a certain depth that it goes that you, it's not worthwhile spending a dollar to, to get, or spending a dollar fifty to pull out a dollar worth of oil. It's not worth it. So that to me is reserved. It's there sitting there because the Bible says in the last when the Lord come, he shall send fire from heaven and fire to burn up the ungodly from on the earth. It's reserved for fire. The depleting of the reserve are telling us that says crude is getting expensive, copper is getting expensive, everything is getting expensive because the reserves are there that can't be doing anything about, can't be extracted. Again, this is an impending problem. Why is that impending problem? Because as oil got back down, as the petroleum gone back down in price. No. It went up for four dollars something, it came back down for three dollars something, and it's now back up to the higher threes. And it's been sitting there. You know why? And they keep having these disasters. I want to tell you something that's an impending problem that I'm going to cover in the morning program when I come back. The, 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 the shrimp is being deformed. Because when they had to deal with that BP disaster, the oil spill in, in, in down there in Louisiana, a lot of the, 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 the defoliant, the, de, um, the, the chemical they sprayed, to the, the dispersant chemical, it was a very toxic chemical. And as the, the shrimp and stuff coming out of the water is deformed. And what it is is that if you go there and interview the people there, they say they don't eat it anymore. Because they're sick, those animals. But they're shipping it for people to enjoy up here. Because there's money on it. But they're not eating it. And this is an impending disaster that is coming. And that's what I'm saying. There's multiple converging things that's getting worse and worse and worse. And it's going to hit, and it's going to be a lot of excitement, right? Almost there. Depleting resources. Religious intolerance is my last point. And then we'll pray. Eldoze will pray. We'll sing one song and then we'll pray. Um, Matthew Mar 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 chapter 16, verse 1 through 4 says, The Pharisees also and the Sadducees came and tempted desire him that he would show them a sign from heaven, as we started out with. He answered and said unto them, When it's even, you say, it will be fair weather, for the skies are red. And when it's morning, it will be foul weather today, for the skies are red and lowering. 
Oh, ye hypocrites, ye can discern the face of the sky, but cannot, can ye not discern the signs of the time? A wicked and adulterous generation seek it after a sign, and there shall be no sign be given unto it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas, and he left them and departed. What I'm simply saying here is that there's enough evidence to base our faith upon by what's even going on, and it will be a second coming. But if people do not want to get that evidence, we're told that the last evidence will be given to this country and to the world is what we call the national son of law, similar to the death of Jesus Christ. That what will happen, this country will, like the Pharisees of old, the religious leaders primarily, will turn their backs on God while still maintaining their false religion. And they will persecute God's people. And this will be the sign similar, because all these scientists tell me that say something is coming, that that was covered, and more we could cover. But people will see these signs and ignore them and keep living the lifestyle that they're still living. And what will end up happening is that says, God said, I'm going to give you one more sign. You will see all your religious leaders turn and become persecutors. And when this happens, God's going to say, this is a big sign. This is going to top all the signs because the righteous is going to become a persecutor. It happened in Christ's time. It happened in the dark ages. And it's going to happen in our time. And that's one of the crises that's coming. Because we don't know. Because when Obama came into power, everybody thought that says, oh, the religious right got tamped down. They didn't go nowhere. They're waiting to come back to put all these, these dark ages laws on the books to persecute God's people. They were doing it under the previous president, President Bush, and they got pulled back because of all the tsunamis and all the disasters. They shut them down. But they're still waiting to come back, and they will pass those laws. Those churches down south, they're becoming more powerful, and they're becoming very much persecuting. So we watch what's going on, and I say, that's the sign that's coming that says religious intolerance will be existed in America. That's what we're told. And that's the sign similar to what happened with the Pharisees of old. All the signs Christ showed them, all the miracles didn't mean nothing to them because they were held bent because Satan had set them up. Thanks for listening again. And we're looking tomorrow evening again to continue this thing at 7.30.